And so here we are in the interface. So we're going to start off with just some very light technical details slash some nuts and bolts stuff. Uh, Forecast Pro itself is a standalone forecasting application. Very simple and straightforward as far as how it's installed and deployed. And so here on the screen, uh, once again, for those that have seen it before, we have the interface and you can see it's changed quite a bit. And so the ribbon menu structure I was describing is perhaps the most notable change. You can see along the top, we have a variety of commands that we can navigate, very similar to say the new Office 365 products. Uh, we have this workspace here in the middle where we're currently showing a graph uh, and a couple formatted views down below. Uh, and then we have this navigator here on the left that lets us navigate around our data. And as I move around, you can see the views on the right sim simply synchronize as we move around uh, my forecasts. Uh, now, in this case, we've already read in a data set. This happens to be data for sales of auto parts. On the graph, the green line represents our history and the purple line represents our forecast. Uh, just nuts and bolts of how it got in here. I mentioned that we easily interface with other with any other system, and to that end, we can easily pull and push data using files or by leveraging a direct database connection. So in this case, I simply pointed at some Excel files. You can see there's a bunch of things that I've pulled in here. Technically, the only thing you have to feed Forecast Pro is your, is your history, and that's what we'll focus on for most of the webinar. And so in this particular instance, I simply pointed at a file, hit this Read and Forecast button, and we were off and running. Okay, uh, and so this data is all in monthly buckets. Uh, just last little note there, uh, it just if you happen to be working in weeks or other periodicities, we do function perfectly fine in those in those periodicities. Uh, so we'll be in months today, but everything that we're talking about would work in weeks all the same. Now, last but not least on the nuts and bolts is if you turn your attention back over here to the hierarchy, uh, this is where we can see those customized hierarchies that I was referring to earlier. And so this particular example has four levels. We have individual parts here at the bottom. And once again, as we jump around, the view simply sinks. These parts are rolling up into warehouse locations. And so you can see we have a variety of aggregate warehouse locations. These continue to roll up into product categories. So you can see here we have mufflers, rims, seats, and windows. And all of that ultimately rolls up to a grand total. Now, as you can see, this helps us visualize our data very effectively. Um, it also facilitates all of the aggregation and disaggregation as we're forecasting. Uh, but the most critical detail here is not so much this particular hierarchy that we're working in today, uh, but more that you can set this up however you want. Uh, you are not limited to four levels, and the levels themselves can represent any kinds of attributes that you want. So in other words, if you want to forecast by customer or by sales region, uh, product families or subcategories or any other number of dimensions, you simply include that in your data, and Forecast Pro will build out that hierarchy for you. Along those lines, a small but important note, uh, we can also pivot the hierarchy around on the fly. So very similar to a pivot table in Excel, if I wanted to see this say skews across all warehouse locations, as opposed to the way we're looking at it now, I could simply move the level up. Okay, so with sort of the, the basics aside, the first thing that happened is we generated a forecast across the board. And so in this first example I have on the screen, this one's nice and clean. You can see there's clearly some patterns in the data namely seasonality, and the system is picking up on that automatically for us. Uh, in a more general sense, there's a variety of statistical methodologies built into Forecast Pro. As you can imagine, the different methods are well suited to different kinds and styles of demand. So some of them are gonna be better suited for more uh, higher volume seasonal kinds of data. Others might be better suited for more sporadic, intermittent styles of demand. Uh, and then, of course, we implement simple models like averages and same as last year's and so on. Uh, but the default is what we call expert selection. And that just means that the system is looking through each of these item location combinations individually and selecting the appropriate models for me all automatically. 
So for example, if you look down here in the bottom right, you can see the system, this is just at the model family level, but you can see it's picking different methods for each individual thing that we're forecasting based on the characteristics of the data. Uh, now, most folks rely pretty heavily on the expert system. Uh, it's a big part of the value that Forecast Pro provides. In this particular example, has 3,000 item location combos, and we're able to just feed it and get a baseline forecast right off the bat. Uh, that being said, I do like to point out two critical details. Uh, one is that the system is not a black box. It will give you all details on how the system picked a method as far as the expert system goes. Uh, and it will also lay out all the glory details of the method that we picked. So for this particular example, the system picked a non-trended but a seasonal model. Um, secondly, we are also able to take full control over the methods that we're using. In other words, we can simply override the expert system anywhere that we want. Uh, I will note that usually we're not trying to beat the machine, so to speak, right? The system's designed to optimize the models for your data. And so usually we're not going to do a better job at picking the, the right model, quote unquote. But if I know something about my data, it's very easy to override it. Uh, so just as a quick example, you know, if I knew we were going to be picking up a few big customers and I spe expected the overall level of this data to increase in a very fundamental sense, I could do that at the model level if I wanted to. So here I could bump this up from 270 to 370, and that'll simply bump up the whole forecast, once again, in a pretty fundamental way. Okay. Now, model changes aside, there are what I would qualify as more practical ways of managing and manipulating your forecasts in the system. And so once again, the three that I mentioned in during the slides are things like data cleanup, and that's where we'll start. Uh, we'll talk about new product forecasting, and we'll talk about overrides, adjustments, and collaboration. Um, and so this is roughly an order of how one might typically implement Forecast Pro, right? We've loaded in some data, and you know now the question becomes, well, what do we do with this data now? And often the first logical thing to do is to clean up anomalies. Because uh, for most of us, our data is going to be imperfect. Um, we're likely to have, say, business interruptions that are causing big gaps in our data, uh, you know, stockouts, uh, lost customers, things like that. Um, I would imagine, particularly at, at this time um, with everything that's going on. Uh, but we might also have big spikes, you know, promotional activity, moving holidays, things of that nature. Uh, and so Forecast Pro has a couple tools built right in uh, that allow us to handle these kinds of anomalies. First, we have an automatic outlier detection and correction system. Uh, this allows you to easily let the system look through all of your data, find outliers, and potentially clean them up. And so if you're comfortable with it, you can even let it find them and clean them up without reviewing them. But as you can imagine, we usually recommend letting the system find them and then take a pass through them uh, and decide what you want to correct for. And so here we have a big list of all the outliers that Forecast Pro has found. Uh, as mentioned, this data set has about 3,000 series in it. So it's uh, not an enormous data set, but certainly big enough where looking at things one by one might be infeasible. Uh, and we can simply double click down this list and very quickly review the various outliers here in the light green that Forecast Pro has found. If I find one that I want to correct for, so let's say if I go back to this one where this data point is you know, six, to, six to seven times where the rest of the uh, data set is, I can simply right click, choose outliers, and choose correct, and that'll rebuild my forecast on the fly. Okay. Alternatively, I might already know what I'm looking for. So maybe I don't need the system to look through my data and find these things for me. You know, so let's say I go straight to this item and I already know, hey, I know I promoted this item back in October and then a few months later in January, I stocked out and that's where these wild swings are coming from. Uh, you can see Forecast Pro is reacting to it um, and usually that's a good thing, right? I want Forecast Pro to react to my data, uh, but in this case, I can explain those things away. And so an alternative, is we have what's called our event manager. The advantage to this is it's very point and click, and it allows us to manage and describe different kinds of events. 
So I could call an event promo. I could call an event stock out. Uh, as you can imagine, in reality, I could get much more specific here, different kinds of promos, maybe dates attached to my stock outs and so on, whatever. Uh, in this simple example, I'll build two described events. And now to apply them, I can simply click on the graph, choose my event, and if you watch the forecast while I do this, it simply cleans it up on the fly. And so I'll flag both, and you can see we end up with a um, much more baseline looking forecast here. Now, data cleanup aside, the other common challenge with our history is what if I don't have any? Or what if I have very little history? And so if we move on to new product approaches uh, here, first of all, Forecast Pro has some nice facilities to find these very fast. Uh, you might already have a list of new products and you might know where you're going, but if you don't, here I've sorted this by how many data points we have by item. And so I can very quickly find, hey, I have zero data points here. I have no data. Here I have one, here I have two, here I have three. Um, and you can see when we have little data, there's not a whole lot that the system can do automatically with these forecasts. And so in this case, we're just doing things like taking averages. Uh, Forecast Pro has some nice simple facilities to do things like, I want this to look like this. And so not to be overly simplistic, but I can do things like copy and paste these shapes from one place to another. So if I wanna grab this shape, I can snag it. In this case, I'm gonna grab that seasonal profile of this data that we could just as easily grab other parts of this data if we want to. And then I can go to my new product and I can apply it as that shape. And so if I choose this seasonal profile I just pulled out, you can see we go from this simple flat line forecast where we simply extrapolated that one data point to getting a nice seasonal forecast by saying, I want this to look like that. Uh, on a related note, uh, we often refer to this approach in general as analogy or by analogy forecasting. Uh, you know, you could of course use this to also do things like change the launch total, change the launch date if appropriate. Uh, and we can also do things like automate the switch over to the expert system at a later time. Uh, new products are always a challenge to some degree, um, but we try to put the tools in place to take away the babysitting aspect of new products as much as possible. Okay. Now, last but not least on these kind of common forecasting challenges, so to speak, are uh, making direct adjustments and overrides. And so if I pop open another view here, uh, here we have this grid view at the bottom. So everything we've talked about so far is really geared toward how can I get the best baseline forecast possible? We started with, I brought in some data, I pressed the button, we generated a statistical forecast. We talked about cleaning data up. Um, so, you know, addressing anomalies in our data. Once again, hopefully getting a better baseline as a result. Uh, and we talked about places where the baseline might be pretty bad because we don't have a lot of data. Uh, but all of that leads to this first row in this grid. From there, we have full control over our forecasts. And we can always layer further adjustment on top of that by plugging in overrides and changes. Um, so kind of just two pieces here before we actually make a few changes. Uh, one is just if you've never seen the grid before, um, a couple things. First off, you can see we can display our history here at the top. Uh, one newish feature in version six is we have some color coding just so you can very easily see uh, where the calendar years lie. Down below, we have the statistical forecast, as I pointed out, and then we have some space to change it and route to this final forecast here at the bottom, which anecdotally is usually the numbers that we're pulling out, are usually the numbers that we're pulling out. Uh, we can customize the view quite a bit, so I can add or remove up to 10 rows from the grid, and I can also change the names. So by default, they're called override one, two, three, but here you can see I've named, renamed them to sales, demand planning, and consensus. Uh, and so to that end, kind of along the lines of how we can customize our hierarchy as much as we want, we can also customize this. And so uh, uh, both of them sort of lead to customizing this stuff based on how we wanna run our process and do our forecasting. 
Uh, just lastly, another little things here. Uh, for those that are looking at version six who are coming from uh, other versions of Forecast Pro, this is also a place where we've introduced some quarterly and year to date totals in the grid uh, just to get some nicer visibility um, into aggregate numbers, uh, which you can simply turn on with checkboxes. Previously, you had to do that with formulas. Okay. Now, as far as actually making changes, pretty easy. We can simply type a value into the grid, and that'll make the change. We have some pre-built functions here at the bottom. So I could adjust by a percentage or an increment of units. As you can imagine, those are pretty common ways of making a change. And as a result, those are just baked in here. If I want to bump up the next six months, or uh, seven months, I'm sorry, say by 15%, I could do that with a click. Uh, and we also support most Excel-like formulas in the grid. So for example, if I want to take an average of two cells, I can do that too. And so in my consensus row, I might type in and say, let's take an average of sales and demand planning and call that our final forecast. Okay, so just as far as bare basics, pretty simple as far as how we make changes. Um, we can, a couple other things here. We can also make changes at any level of our hierarchy. So right now I'm adjusting a particular SKU down here at the bottom. If I now jump up to Chicago or mufflers or the total, we'll see those changes reflected in the final forecast here at the bottom. And so those changes are automatically aggregating in the context of this hierarchy. Uh, to that end, you can see there's also some light color coding here to indicate where overrides exist and where the group totals are being impacted by overrides elsewhere. Uh, but we can also make adjustments at higher levels. So let's say I want to adjust mufflers as a whole. You know, let's say for June, I'll set this to 10,000. We can do that too. And the system will automatically take that and blow it down proportionally to everything inside mufflers. And so that affords us a lot of flexibility and power in terms of where and how we choose to make changes uh, into our forecasts. Um, and as you can imagine, it also plays a big role in deciding how you might want to structure your hierarchy in the first place, because this will kind of dictate what level of granularity do we have access to and what kind of group levels do we have access to. Uh, from a transparency perspective, uh, there's also a comment facility here. So, you know, earlier I took an average of these two. I might want to annotate that I did that. So I could say average of sales and demand planning. That's on a per cell basis and just adds another dimension of transparency as we're making adjustments. Uh, and last but not least here, there's also a whole audit trail of overrides as you can see here. So you may have noticed this window started off empty, but as I made overrides, this started to populate. And this is sort of a global view of any change that I've ever made. Um, as you saw with the outliers, these are all filterable and sortable. So, you know, many, Forecast Pro users end up with many, many overrides, uh, sometimes on the order of hundreds or thousands. This allows you to very easily sift through overrides that have been made based on date or comment or row and so on. Okay. Now, a closely related piece here is we're often going to want to pull in these overrides from other people. So this is all well and good if I'm the the main user, the demand planner, and I'm in here keying in my changes, but what if I need to get other folks involved in Forecast Pro? And so this is where one of the other key new features in version six comes into play. We've now implemented a kind of formal Excel collaboration system um, that comes as part of the collaborator licenses that we also offer. And so first, just high level, this allows us to very easily check out spreadsheets for folks to review allow them to make changes, and then check them back in. And so first off, to show you know, a quick example, you can segment these spreadsheets however you want. Um, the most robust way to do it is to assign attributes to the various data based on who you want them to go to. So for example, assigning these various SKU location combinations to salespeople is a pretty logical thing to do. And so here, just to visualize, here's those attributes assigned to individual sales folks across my data. I can then very easily use that information to chop up 
this data into spreadsheets and send it out if I want to all salespeople at the same time. For the sake of the demo, I'll quickly just export one sheet for Mike. I'll hit the export button and in just a click, we will have generated a spreadsheet that's ready to go for Mike. Uh, now, of course, at this juncture, Mike would open up the sheet, make his change, and then when he's done, we'd bring it back in. Uh, but just to show you what it looks like, um, as this opens, there are a couple options for these new templates. Uh, these are not just raw spreadsheets. They do have some nice functionality in them, namely things like dynamic graphs, changes tracking, the ability to insert comments. And of course, most importantly, you don't need to fiddle with any of the formatting with the sheet on the way in or out. Um, so here's the sheet. You can see as I jump around this simple template, which is simply a list of all 250 or so forecasts here. The graph updates as we move around. I can make changes to this sheet and those changes are tracked. We can add comments to these changes as we go. And so, as I said, Mike can make his changes, save his sheet. And then when I get the sheet back, I simply come into Forecast Pro and hit the import button. And once again, in practice, if you're checking this out to many people, you could check out five sheets at the same time, let them all make changes, and then import them all. But in this case, we'll just import the, uh, the one sheet. Okay. Um, so that'll take just one second to come in. Uh, as it does, I'll just once again note, uh, if, you, if you are interested in, in this uh, functionality, there's quite a bit more to it than what I went through today. Uh, we are going to have a more in-depth webinar on the Excel collaboration system specifically on Friday. So, so do check that out if that's of interest. Okay. Now, last but not least, this grid view is quite powerful. So as you saw, it supports a lot of ways to uh, do things like make formulas, we can customize the row names and so on, uh, but we can even go a step further than that. Um, you may or may not have noticed when at the very beginning when I pulled open the screen containing my data that there was a whole bunch of stuff listed here besides just my historical demand. And this is where we can synthesize uh, all sorts of other information in Forecast Pro besides just the history. Um, there's a variety of places to see it, uh, but in particular, um, we often use the grid and the graph to display this uh, other customized information. Um, so first off, just as an aside, I mentioned multiple graphs as one of the new features. Here's just a quick example of that. Um, here on this graph, this is uh, just three SKUs across three different warehouses graphed together. Uh, over here is my customer forecast, which we'll talk about in a second, graphed against my adjusted and my statistical forecast. So you can have a lot of control over the graphing facilities here. Uh, but if you turn your attention back to the grid, and I scroll down a little bit, you'll notice we have a bunch of other information loaded in. So notably, we have a row for dollars. Uh, Forecast Pro allows us to convert between units of measure on the fly. So in this case, my default uh, units are here in eaches, uh, but I can quickly convert from eaches into dollars because I've defined an average selling price for each item location combo. Um, that, that allows me to see it, but I could also make adjustments in other units. Moving further down, we have a customer forecast that I've loaded in. Um, doing things like bringing in external forecasts can be very common in sales and operations processes, or I might be juggling multiple forecasts. And so in this case, if I'm getting a forecast from a customer, I could import it. And here I've set up some custom formulas that allow me to compare the two forecasts against each other. Um, and of course, the goal here would often be to try to identify the big gaps and close those gaps. Uh, and then finally, I have a row for open orders. So typically, uh, you know, we're mostly interested in what you might call unconstrained demand going forward. But it's, if it's helpful for you to see things like what's on order, what's on hand, we can load in data points like that. Um, and so this is just a very light example to give you a flavor for some of the stuff you can do in this grid. Um, but just to be clear, this stuff is very open-ended. There's no real limitations on the kind of data you bring in. The only requirement is that it fits into this hierarchy that you've chosen to set up. Okay. All right, so at this point, we've talked about sort of the, the basic ways and kind of chronology of bringing in some data, 
and making some changes. So we bring in our fork, we bring in our data, we generate some forecasts, and then we might manipulate them uh, based on you know things we know about our business, um, problems in our data, and so on. When we're done, we of course need to save the results. Uh, we'll talk about output maybe at the very end. Uh, but as we start moving forward, our actuals are going to start trickling in. And one other key thing we're probably going to want to do is start tracking those actuals against the forecasts that we've been generating. And so the system is also designed to do this automatically for you. Um, what I'm pulling up here is what's called a waterfall chart. Um, some or maybe many of you have worked with waterfall charts before. Um, for those that haven't, I'll, I'll walk through this briefly to, to give a, you a feel for what you're looking at. Uh, but in a nutshell, this is a great way of looking at forecast accuracy over time. Um, so I, I sometimes talk to folks who build these views on their own, um, you know, folks who are in spreadsheets and are manually capturing and archiving their forecasts. Uh, but building these can be pretty cumbersome. They're fairly involved. Uh, and maybe more importantly, when you have a reasonably large scale or a complex hierarchy like this, that can be tough too. And this is something that Forecast Pro just builds out of the box for all items and at all levels. You can see it syncs up as I move around the data just like everything else. Uh, and so what we're looking at here, as we move forward through time, the system assumes we're forecasting on a rolling basis. And every time we roll forward, the system snapshots one of those forecasts. So in November, we forecasted this. Then we would have rolled forward into December and reforecasted this, and then rolled forward into January and reforecasted and so on. And so here's all these different snapshots of those forecasts, which of course I can compare to each other. That's useful in its own right. But I can also compare them against the actuals, which are listed here along the top in green. And so this gives us a very comprehensive view into what we forecasted versus what we actually happened for any item. Um, along the bottom are some of the more consolidated metrics, namely things like average percent error, average unit error, and so on. And so tracking this stuff is useful, but where it really come, uh, the usefulness really comes into play is in our exception style views. Um, and so the exception style views let us do things like list many metrics all at the same time, right? The waterfall chart is very specific to a given item or a group, but I might want to list all of my average errors. Um, and the intention, of course, might be to say, well, among these 3,000 item warehouse combinations, I can't realistically look at every single one every single month, but I can review my top 10 worst offenders, for example. Um, and so once again, in the spirit of identifying some of the new stuff in version six, here's that heat map functionality. You do have some control over how this looks, but you can see that this just highlights it in sort of a gradient fashion where these big errors are in red, for example. Um, but in particular, like I said, the, the goal is to look at the biggest ones first. So I might sort this from largest to smallest, double click the first one, and in three clicks, we have jumped to our least accurate item over the past few months. Uh, this idea is not limited to accuracy tracking. Um, you can really customize these exception views uh, quite a bit. Um, we have a couple out of the box ones, you might say. And so here's sort of a light list of them. You can see one is just called custom if you wanna build it from scratch, essentially. Uh, but just as food for thought, another common example might be to compare the current forecast against last month's forecast, right? As we update our forecast over time, I might want to understand where has the forecast changed suddenly? And so here's the current forecast versus last month's forecast. They're also graphed here against each other. Um, but once again, the real goal is usually to sort them, double click, and very quickly I can see here, last month we were forecasting you know, basically zero, now we're forecasting 200. Is that just volatility? Do I expect that change? Do I need to talk to somebody, et cetera? And so last but not least for the, for the demo is a pretty simple topic. When we're done, we of course need to get these results out. Um, and so as I've walked through these various views, uh, first off, you may have noticed I've been making extensive use of these layouts. Um, this is uh, an extension of version five 
an older functionality called bookmarks. Uh, once again, some improvements here. Um, but these views are all customizable. Um, and in addition to customizing them, we can also right click and we can save out any of these reports or views at any time to spreadsheets. Uh, I often refer to that more as the quick and dirty save. If you wanna push it out to a spreadsheet on the fly for your own purposes or to hand off to somebody or to publish somewhere, that's always just a right click. Uh, but this view that I just pulled up here, this is just a big dump of the forecasts. Once again, this is uh, highly customizable. We can set it up to look however we want and we can also write it out to any format. So it could go down to Excel or CSV or text. We could also drop the results directly out to a database that we're connected to. And so just closing the loop on something that I started with, um, that being that we connect seamlessly to any system that you might happen to have, this is what allows us to do that. Uh, we can set up forecast post output to accommodate that destination, whatever that destination might happen to be.